challenges and successes, hardship and joy, pain and blessings. The dichotomies of life, right? We eagerly embrace successes, joys, and blessings, yet we become frustrated when challenges, hardship, and pain intersect our lives. But what if the tough times of life are just cleverly disguised opportunities to grow? Resilience, strength, wisdom, courage, and grit are grown when we embrace and choose to learn from those challenging times of life. I invite you to tune your ear to the lessons and insights my guests gained when they fought to overcome the tough times that intersected their lives. Consider how their strategies, mindsets, and habits equipped and empowered them to grow, even thrive, despite the challenges they faced. Welcome to the Challenges Won't Stop Me podcast. I'm your host, Melanie Brown. I'm honored you've chosen to listen to this episode. I believe you will be encouraged and inspired to seek to grow through your challenges. Let's keep moving forward. I am always blessed beyond measure by the incredible overcomers that God introduces me to. I met today's guest, Carol McLeod, at last year's Blue Ridge Christian Writers Conference. In our brief conversation between classes, I realized I hadn't read any of her books, and the conversation that we had made me realize that I needed to. So when I got home, I, of course, did what we all do, went to Amazon, looked up her books, read through the descriptions. Although, and we'll talk about this in a moment, I didn't read carefully enough, but I chose the book, Meanwhile, the subtitle is Meeting God in the Wait, and I pushed the Buy Now button. When it arrived, I realized it was a Bible study, which was not a bad thing, except it was just different from my expectations, and wow, and that's what we're going to be talking about today the meanwhiles of our life, and what happens in that time of waiting. Powerful, truly powerful. Let me tell you just a little bit about Carol. Carol is an overcomer, an award-winning author of 16 books, soon to be 17 and 18, host of the Significant Women podcast, international speaker, wife of 44 years to Craig, mother of five adult children, and Marmy to her 10 grandchildren, whom she refers to as the 10 wonders of the world. (laughs) I absolutely love that. So welcome to the show, Carol. Oh, thank you, Melanie. I have been looking forward to this since the day I met you. I just knew we had a kindred spirit thing going on, and I can't wait to talk about books and Jesus and waiting and miracles and all of the above. And we got to talk about overcoming just a bit, too, because we'll do it. We'll do it. That was what the part of our conversation that I keyed in on immediately was a kindred spirit, someone who had gone through some struggles and knew I can't give up. Right. That God is with me and I'm going to fight this and I'm going to get through this. And there is a plan, which just based on reading and doing the Bible study of meanwhile is very clear that you've gained wisdom from what you've learned in the Bible and incorporated it into your own life as well. Through this Bible study, you pull out parts of Joseph's life, what he learned and how he kept moving forward that I had never considered before. No one other than you had ever pointed it out. So I am just grateful that you followed God's prompting on your heart to write this Bible study because it is just power packed. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Thank you, Melanie. You're so welcome. Introduce what the word meanwhile means to you, especially in accordance with this Bible study. 
Yeah. So Melanie, Joseph has always been my favorite Old Testament Bible character. I've always loved this young man who held tight to his faith when he was in horrific circumstances. Mm -hmm. He's always been a a hero of the faith to me. And and one day, several years ago, I was just reading my Bible and I was supposed to read in in Genesis chapter 37 that day. And I was thinking, oh, good. I'm going to start Joseph again. And for the first time, Melanie, I saw a word in Joseph's story that took my breath away. So, you know, Genesis 37 is about Joseph is the favorite. His daddy loves him. He gives him a multicolored coat. His brothers hate him. Joseph is a dreamer. One day his daddy says, hey, Joey, would you go see your brothers and and take them some food? They're taking care of my flocks near Shechem. And so Joseph said, Yes, daddy, I will go. And first of all, let me pause there because that's a word when Joseph says to his dad, I'm in. It's the Hebrew word hineni. And it means I'm here. I'm all in. I'll give you all I've got. And I have found myself saying hineni to the father thousands of times since I read that. But moving along, Joseph went to visit his brothers and Melanie, as you know, he was beat up, put into a pit and sold into slavery. And the very last verse of Genesis chapter 37, verse 36, first time I'd ever seen it, Melanie, said this. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Meanwhile, and my heart stopped and I thought, what? Meanwhile, we all go through meanwhiles in life. We all encounter circumstances that we hate and we would never choose as our own. And yet God is in the meanwhile. And so this Bible study was born in that instant. But the way I define a meanwhile, I define it several ways. And I'll get to the more theological way in a minute, but the understandable way is when you pray and 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 and nothing happens. That's a meanwhile in life. A meanwhile is when you don't like the hand you've been dealt, but you're still clinging to the God you serve. That's a meanwhile. A meanwhile, and this is the best definition, it's the test of faith between when the crisis happens and God's visible intervention. That's the meanwhile. And so the meanwhile is a test, Melanie. Will we stand or won't we? Will we declare or won't we? Will we worship or won't we? Will we honor God? Will we keep tithing or won't we? Will we keep going to church or won't we? Will we keep loving difficult people or won't we? Those are the tests that a meanwhile presents in all of our lives. It is just So power packed, everything that you just said, the examples, what happens. I'd love to add this to it because this is part of what my ministry is about in that in those meanwhiles, we have two choices. We can live in defeat. Woe is me. Life is awful. Never will be the same. Or we can say, I don't see what's happening. I don't feel like God is working, but I'm going to fight to overcome because he has equipped me. And I know that I will be learning things and growing during this time period. So live in defeat or fight to overcome in that meanwhile. A little bit further into the book, you talk about the actions that you take during your meanwhiles matter and they matter very much. Yeah. And I could not agree with that more. Yeah. You know, the actions we take are so important. I tell women all the time, Melanie, listen, I can't change your circumstances, but I can help you process them according to the word of God. We cannot change our meanwhiles. We cannot escape our meanwhiles. But what we do with our meanwhiles is going to determine the map of our lives. It's going to determine the landscape of our lives. Like you just pointed out, am I always going to live in pain? Am I always going to be discouraged? Am I always going to be, as you know, Melanie, one of the things I've overcome and I'm still overcoming is depression. I have battled depression my entire adult life. And Mm -hmm. every day I have to make a decision who I am going to be that very day. And Melanie, I decided years ago, my goal in life is not to be famous, but it's to be faithful. And Joseph was faithful in the meanwhile. And will you be faithful 
in the meanwhile. That is the most important choice you make during a meanwhile. One of the teachings I'm creating right now, I believe the name of it is going to be called Yes, because we say yes to God. Yes, Jesus, come into my heart. Yes, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Yes, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. But then there are thousands of other yeses we have to say to God, and most of them are said in the meanwhile. Yes, I want the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I want the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I want to be wise. Yes, I will love difficult people. So what we do in the meanwhile is eternally important. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah. What you were saying a moment ago, we can be miserable mm-hmm. during the meanwhile. Mm-hmm. And when we're miserable, it permeates into everything else in our lives. If it's mm-hmm. a mental health issue or if it's a health issue that, that we're struggling with or our finances are not in good shape, but we're miserable, it's going to permeate into all the other areas of our lives. Will things go wrong? Maybe. It doesn't matter. It's just it makes your whole life just yuck. Yeah, and yeah. like you said, it's a choice. It, it is, is a choice. And it's a hard choice. There are some days that even with my health issues, I, like you, I have to say, oh, I just want to stay in the bed and just mope. But I make the choice that I've got things that God has asked me to do, things right. that I want to do, that I can impact others, that I can mm-hmm. pour into others. When I do those things, instead of choosing to be mopey, then it lifts my spirits and it affirms and reaffirms what I know about God and how he is with me. And I like the part of the definition of meanwhile that you said, it's the test of faith between a crisis and God's visible intervention because Mm -hmm. he's intervening every moment of Every situation, every challenge, difficult time, grief, pain, whatever, the problem is we have such a hard time with not seeing things, not seeing the visible part of it. So I love how you made the distinction there that it's a test of faith between your crisis and God's visible intervention. Yeah. And Melanie, the truth is we are called to walk by faith, yes. not by sight. Yes. So what we see in the natural is way down on the list of priorities. What's important is that we are walking by faith. We're keeping our eyes on Jesus. And listen, we have to remind ourselves every day while we're waiting, he's working. What are you doing, Carol? Ooh. You're waiting but he's working. Make no mistake about it. God is not resting. God is working on my behalf. There's a Psalm that I love. Man, Melanie, I should have looked up the the reference, but you can do it later. And it says, God will accomplish what concerns me. Okay. That sends chills through my body Mm. that we serve a God who doesn't leave a job undone. He doesn't leave a job half finished. Whatever concerns you, Melanie, whatever you're concerned about today, whatever stressing you out or bringing anxiety, God is going to accomplish it. You're not. God will accomplish what concerns Melanie. We will put that verse in the show notes. Great. I'm going to Thank that you. up as soon as we finish okay. today because okay. that is powerful. Yeah. Yes. We need to have that on a, a sticky note everywhere. We do. We do. We need plaques Absolutely. in our home. Yeah. We need jewelry with it on. We need the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> One of the quotes that stopped me, and I read it and reread it and highlighted it and told my husband Jeff about it. And then the next day when I was working on the next section of the Bible study, I came back to it and I just stared at it because I I thought, wow, this is so meaningful when we are going through challenges. And if people knew this, I think that it really would impact how they walk through those difficult times. So here's what you said in your study. Just as God has a plan for your life, so does the enemy. His ugly plan is that you, as a believer in Christ, will live out your earthly days in the pit of despair, the pit of hopelessness, and the pit of unending depression. There is no potential for growth or nourishment there. This is the part Mm -hmm. that just, just really got to me. The devil is unable to take eternal life from you 
So he endeavors to take abundant life from you. Yeah. Girl. I I mean, I know. So Melanie, I learned that from my dad. My dad told me that. My dad was a general of the faith, a quiet man. His name doesn't show up in any history book, but God's. But he taught me so much about faith. And that's what he told me one day when we were studying the word together. The enemy is a liar. He has force, but no power. His power was taken out at the cross of Calvary, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He pretends he's a lion, but he's not really one. He's a lion with a roar, but no fangs. And so he (laughs) roars at us. I like that. Yeah. He (laughs) roars at us and he tries to convince us that nothing's ever going to change, that God is not aware of what we're going through, that we're not worthy, that our kids are never going to come back, that our finances are never going to change, that our health is never going to get better. And what he's trying to do is extract the abundant from our lives. And so we have to be very careful as believers to stand firm and to say, oh no, you're not going to touch my abundant. Oh, oh no, my abundant is not for you. It's for me. And so like in my life, Melanie, I say, no, you will not have my joy. No, my joy is mine. I have fought for it. Jesus gave it to me. I know where it is. It's in his presence. There's fullness of joy. And you're not going to take it. And actually, in the book of John, Jesus said, no one can take your joy from you. And so Mm -hmm. I stand on that promise. So I don't know what your listeners deal with, fear, anxiety, worry, bitterness, unforgiveness, abuse as a child. Let me tell you, let those things go and hold on to your abundant. Because all of those things I just listed, worry, fear, anxiety, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. All of those things are the tools of the enemy to rob you of an abundant life that Jesus died to give you. So hang on to joy. Hang on to hope. Say, you're not going to have my hope. You're not going to have my trust. You're not going to have my faith. You're not going to have my peace. I'm holding on to those things. Well said, truly. It makes me think about the voices we hear because yes, the voices in my head are just nonstop. We have to know God's word enough and be in his word enough that we can distinguish between the voices that are telling us truth and the voices that, like you said, are trying to defeat us and throw us into all of this negativity and lies, essentially what they are. Right, right. I have learned God's voice is a whisper, but Satan's voice, he's screaming at you. He's He's roaring. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's roaring, as you said. Mm -hmm. I have a saying that I use with my students when I'm tutoring, that repetition is your friend. When it comes to learning and you're repeating that information different ways, different strategies, it helps you to learn it. Well, Satan uses repetition not as a friendly thing. He's actually using it in quite the opposite way. He's repeating it because the more that we hear that and soak it in and not push it away, then we're going to start believing it. And we're going to hear that voice so much more and believe that voice more than what we believe about what God's word says about us, which is the truth. They are taking away that abundant life from us, Carol. And I have gone back to that quote numerous times. It is just powerful because it is so power packed with truth. Yeah. I love what you're saying about voices. So Melanie, basically there are three voices that we contend with, that we deal with. God's voice, the enemy's voice, and our own voice. And we need to learn how to identify each voice because then we know what to do with it. So one day I was talking to one of my grandchildren on the phone. So my son has a large family, four kids. And at the time they were all between four and 10 years old. Okay. So most little people's voices at that age sound about the same. And they all call me Marmy and they all have the same accent. It was my son's phone. So I knew it was one of those four. And I chatted along with this child thinking it was somebody and it was one of the other children. And I had a whole conversation thinking it was the wrong person that I was talking to Olivia, but I was really talking to Wesley. And at the end of the conversation, I thought, I said, Wesley, I'm so sorry. All this time, I thought you were Olivia. And as I hung up, the Lord said, Carol, remember this conversation because you can have an entire conversation with the enemy 
and think it's me and it's not. You can have an entire conversation with yourself and think it's me and it's not. So when you hear something come at you that you know is important, that you know you're going to linger on, the first thing you say to yourself, is this me? Is this the enemy or is this God? And I can tell you this about God. Although God may whisper, his voice sounds a whole lot like scripture. <laughs> so, yes. you know, yes. when, take it to the word. And if it lines up with the word, it's God. If it's contrary to the word, it's the enemy. That's why, Melanie, reading the word and memorizing the word and studying the word is of vital importance because it helps you identify the voice you're listening to. I always say, would you give the Holy Spirit something to work with? How can the Holy Spirit remind you of what God has said if you don't know what God has said? Amen. Open the Bible and read it, linger over it. So God's voice sounds a whole lot like the word. And my voice, (laughs) I can be an emotional mess. Usually my voice is pretty emotional and I need to get my voice in line with the word of God. The value of reading God's word and studying God's word and memorizing God's word, you can't put a value on that. It is invaluable. You know, Melanie, if I told you that I had a project For you to invest in and that whatever you invested, you are going to get an exponential return. So Melanie, if you invest a hundred dollars in my project, chances are you're going to get millions back. I can guarantee you, Melanie, you're going to get millions back. Would you not invest in it? Well, it's the same thing with the word of God. When we take time out of our day to invest in the word of God, the return on investment is exponential. It will revolutionize everything about your life. And I always say this, reading the word is sort of like going to the gym. You know, the first day it hurts. The second day you don't want to go back because it hurt. But if you keep going, all of a sudden you're going to think, what? My jeans are a little bit looser today. And what? My arms aren't quite as flabby today. If you keep going, it's the same way with the word of God. If you read the Bible consistently and daily, all of a sudden you're going to say to yourself, what? I didn't spend as much money this month. What happened to me? The word of God happened to you. What? I was kinder to my mother-in-law this month. What happened to me? The word of God happened to you. What? I didn't worry about my kids as much this month. What happened to me? The word of God happened to you. So the word of God, the return on investment is priceless. That was a great example. One of the other quotes that got me, it all goes in accordance with what God has called me to do. And that is to focus on the challenges that we go through and how we respond, how he responds during those times. And it was near the end of the book. And it says, Joseph spoke generously because his life had been refined by human pain. And he saw the unprecedented and miraculous plan of God unfold. And he spoke generously to his brothers who had started this whole cycle of difficulties in Joseph's life. Were they responsible for the other ones? No, absolutely not. But that was kind of the catalyst. And now we're doing a full circle moment, which God doesn't always do a full circle, but there are times when he does. And Joseph His response could have been so many different things. His response was so kind and loving, as you said here, because his life had been refined by human pain. And through everything that he saw and experienced, the wisdom of Joseph is that he did know and he did at some point see It was God's plan all along, which then, of course, leads us to Genesis 50, 20, which is quoted all the time and is truly a beautiful verse, which says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many nations. Yeah. Yeah. So you're referring to Melanie when Joseph was met his brothers when they were coming back to Egypt. So meanwhile, as you've pointed out, is a Bible study. It also comes with a video teaching series, if any of your listeners are interested in that. Yeah, you can do it in a small group of Bible study. But the reason I point that out is because when I teach on this particular topic, on these particular verses, I'm undone and I'm sobbing all the way through it. I can't even catch my breath because this picture in in Scripture might be the most beautiful picture in Scripture other than the cross of Jesus Christ. 
that what we see take place in this broken, disjointed, malfunctioning family is a miracle. Yes. That Joseph the abused, Joseph the battered, would welcome his brothers, would open arms, throw his arms around them, and say, guys, we're a family. Guys, let's do this. Let's do life together. Guys, everything I have is yours. What? How does that happen? It only happens when God does a work inside the abused one, inside the battered one. And so I don't know how many of your listeners have dealt with abuse in their life, have dealt with rejection by their family. Let God do a Joseph work in you. Let God refine you, strengthen you, change you, and see what happens. This scene would never have taken place if Joseph had held on to his pain. If Joseph had said, they don't deserve it. The way they treated me, no, I'm done. I'm done with those guys. This scene never would have happened. This scene never would have happened if Joseph had said, they don't deserve it. The way they treated me, they don't deserve it. Melanie, this scene never would have happened if Joseph had said, I deserve to feel the way I do. But instead, Joseph submitted to the teaching power of the Holy Spirit, to the refining that happens when we say, not my will, but yours be done. And because of this, it changed everything for human history. This miracle ricochets through the centuries to our lives even today. So, you know, one thing I learned about the book of Genesis, and you read this, Melanie, is that Genesis is not just the first book of the Bible, but it's the foundation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And and many of the lessons taught in Genesis are taught throughout the entire scripture. So this particular scene is a precursor to Calvary, how Jesus said, I forgive you. Come on. Everything I have is yours. Let's do life together. Come on. We're a family. This is the foreshadowing of what Jesus was about to do. Don't even get me started on Genesis 50, 20. Sister, do you have three <laughs> weeks for a podcast? Don't even get me started. So Genesis 50, 20, at the very end of the story, when the brothers are afraid because Jacob, the dad, has just died and the brothers are afraid, okay, J- Jacob is no longer here to make sure that Joseph treats us well. Joseph is going to start to treat us bad now. And in Genesis 50, 20, so Melanie, this is what I picture it. So they're all old men by now. They're paunchy, you know, guts, and, and they have long gray Hebrew beards and wrinkled skin and balding heads. And, and Joseph says, probably with tears rolling on his face, guys, look at me. You intended to harm me. That is true. But God used it for a greater good so that a generation would be saved. My friend, no matter what pain you've gone through, no matter how you've been mistreated, abused, rejected, your God is Joseph's God. And he is able to take that moment of human searing, fierce pain and turn it into a miracle. Do you believe it or don't you? When Joseph said to his brothers, you meant to harm me, but God intended it for good. So this word is the Hebrew word makashaba. I want, wherever you're sitting right now, I want you to say it out loud. Makashaba. Makashaba. Thank you. Thank Ah. you, Melanie. I know. Okay. So this is the word that's used in Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, hey, y'all, I've got plans for you. I've got good plans for you. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. That Hebrew word plans is makashaba. See, this is the deal that God can makashaba any painful human event and turn it into a miracle. So the word makashaba doesn't just mean plans. It doesn't just mean dreams, which is the way um, G- Jeremiah 29, 11 translates it. It's not just intentions, which is the way Genesis 50, 20 translates it, but it means like a creative masterpiece. It means a great work of art. It means an imagination that's one of a kind. And so when God looks at the pain-filled avenues of your life, God says, I can do something with that. If this person will cling to me, 
will know that I'm there, just like Joseph did. If this person will continue to worship me and pray and stay close, I can take this event and maka shaba it for a greater good. And listen, Melanie, I've got areas in life where I'm believing for maka shaba. <laughs> I, oh, I've got, do. yeah, I've got health issues. I've got kid issues. I've got finance issues. God, I need you to mock a Shaba. And I'm clinging and I'm aware of his presence and I'm going to keep forgiving and I'm going to keep singing and I'm going to keep praying and I'm going to keep being kind because I serve the God of Joseph. Amen. Going back to the definition of meanwhile, at some point I'm going to see your visible intervention. Yeah. I'm believing that it's going to happen. And in the meantime, in the meanwhile, I'm going to trust and have faith. I just appreciate so much what we've talked about today. I want to ask one last question. Sure. How do you keep moving forward when you encounter challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. I read my Bible every day, Melanie. Without the word, I would be an empty shell of a woman. I sing. Now, I might sing with tears rolling down my cheeks, but I sing. I will not let anything stop my song. I will not let any relationship, any disappointment, or any circumstance rob me of the song that I was born to sing to my Savior. On my worst days, I say, Carol, go give something to somebody. And so I'll write an email or a note, or I'll go out and buy somebody's a cup of coffee. I'll smile at a young mom in the grocery store and tell her she's doing a good thing because our endorphin levels actually raise when we are kind to somebody else. And those endorphins help us fight off discouragement and depression and anxiety. So I have to make myself do it, Melanie, but I do it. So those are some of the practical things I do. I go for a walk outside. I'm a walker and I love walking in God's creation. I put in my earbuds and I listen to worship music or great teachings. It lifts me up. I call friends who are happy people who are also committed to Christ. So those are some things that some of your listeners can do. But I want to close by saying this. Tozer says that the most important, the most A vital part of your life is the very first thought you have about God. Like, what do you think when you think the name God? And we, for us to get through the hard times in life, we have to know who God is. That's the bottom line, Melanie. That's the foundation. All those other things are for naught unless I have an eternal and truthful view of the character of God. And God is good. Don't turn it into rocket science. Don't make it harder than it is. We serve a God who is everlastingly good. You know, whatever God is, he is that attribute eternally, enthusiastically, and perpetually. And we serve an enthusiastically good God. So that's my first thought about him. Whenever I'm discouraged, I think, oh, but God is so good. He never stops being good. Every cell in God's body, if if he does have a body and if he does have cells, is good. And I can build a life upon that. My circumstances might not be good. My relationships might be disappointing. But I serve a God whose goodness surpasses every other thought, every other idea I could ever have in life. It might sound simple, Melanie, but it's true. It does sound simple and hard all in one because, again, it's a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. I think that is a beautiful way to wrap up. I wanted to mention a few things. Yeah. I am so, so excited about your 17th book, which is coming out in June. Yes. It is titled overflowing, living abundantly in a broken culture. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I have to just throw this one thing out. The listeners may not know this. You know this because I sent this in the email. I know what you're going to say. Yep. My word for this year is overflow. Yeah. It it is. It's just amazing. God is just Mm -hmm. so kind, so kind. So I cannot wait to hear what you are going to share in the book, but also I've signed up for the virtual portion of your 20th Carol McLeod Ministries Conference. Yes. It is going to be April 26th through the 27th in 
West Seneca, New York. Unfortunately, the finances are not here for me to come in person because I would love to be there in person and hug your neck, but I am doing it virtually. And so those are still opportunities, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Just go to my website, Carol McLeod Ministries. You'll see everything about the conference. Come in person, watch virtual as you're going to Melanie, but it's going to be an astounding event as the daughters of God experience the overflow of his presence and the truth of scripture. I cannot wait. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you, Carol. This has been amazing. I've loved it. I've loved every minute of it. You're an amazing interviewer. And I'll never forget the first day I met you. It was pouring rain. Yes. Blue Ridge. Our hair was both curly, curly, curly because of the humidity and pouring rain under an umbrella. And we knew I got a new sister. Absolutely. Yeah. God is so kind to do things like that. I am so blessed. Thank you, friend. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.